because I'm, I'm really clear on the fact that I think everybody comes to work wanting to do a good job. G'day, I'm Peter Anthony. Welcome to Growth Tales. Amanda Cruz is an expert in transformation. Expect to learn why teams work in transformation and why they don't, and why if you're in a team, maybe you should look around. Here's Amanda's story. G'day, Amanda. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Today we're talking about teams and transformation, which is a big topic. I'm, I'm just curious about when organisations know they need transformation. Yeah, it's, that's the big question, isn't it? Because, you know, transformation has been a real buzzword, maybe even over the last 15 or 20 years. But I, I'm going to reflect upon an organisation that I worked with successfully. And the phone call that I got was from the executive who said, I've got a team here and this team is a basket case. Wow. This team cannot get where they need to go. Uh, they need really strong guidance and leadership. And I want you to come in and spend some time and help us to transform this team from where they are today to where they need to be. And so that was the real, the real cue was the organisation knew that they had a team of people, potentially a team of people who could be high performers who were just missing the mark. Okay. Um, and so how do you know what that mark is? Well, every organisation knows what they're trying to achieve, hopefully. They've mm -hmm. got their strategy and they know the cogs in the wheel that work together in order to get that strategy delivered. Okay. And I'm going to talk not about the actual name of that organisation, but that team was a communication team. So comms okay. teams, as you and I both know, play enormously important roles in organisations, not only to get the messages out to their potential clients and the clients they already know, but also to the people within that organisation, to give them the steer, give them the confidence and to give them the clarity that the organisation is heading in the right direction. Yes. So when that's broken, people know. <laughs> Yeah, it's very obvious, isn't it? It's like we can see it really clearly. And I guess part of the issue there too is getting the messages right and thinking about how to frame those messages to different internal and external audiences. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah, but I think messages comes last, if I'm really? going to be perfectly okay. honest. Okay. I think what we needed to do in that situation was to come in and understand that team really deeply, understand okay. where they were at understand where, what they had experienced in the past and what they were thinking success looked like. And then it was a matter of saying, well, how do we take the current state that we know that we're currently in, which is not working, mm -hmm. what is the future state that we want to move to and how big is that gap and mm -hmm. what are the things that we need to do to put in place with that team in order to help them to be successful. Because I'm, I'm really clear on the fact that I think everybody comes to work wanting to do a good job. People mm. want to be part of high-performing teams. Everyone, Amanda, everyone wants to do a good job, do they? <laughs> really? I, I've met some people It's curious. I'm thinking, do you really want to do a good job or are you just turning up to get a paycheck and pay now, the mortgage? That's a whole other podcast. But I reckon <laughs> what we're talking about there, there is definitely disenchantment and disenfranchisation. Mm. Uh, what yes. is the word? Disenfranz... Oh. Ah. They're disenfranchised. They're, They're disenfranchised. Disenfranchised people in organisations. They don't get there on day one. No. They arrive probably full of vim and vigour, full of excitement. If they've done a degree, they want to be able to use the learnings that they've got. Yeah. They want to build yeah. their skills. They want to learn from others in the workplace. Uh, and it's taken them a very long time to get to the place that you're talking about now, Peter, where they yes, yeah. probably just show up, yeah. get the paycheck and go home. And they've probably tried time and time again yes. to have an impact and it just yes. hasn't worked. And I guess if you if you treat them that way, if, if you treat them as if uh, you're someone that wants to make an impact, you're someone that is here to, to make a difference and enjoy the process, mm. they're more likely to respond that way. So, mm. right. You know yeah. what? The hardest part about team transformation comes down to the hardest person within that team to convince. Okay. So if you've got a team of people that generally are willing, but they've got a reputation. So this team I'm thinking about now had over a period of years mm. developed a reputation, not for non-delivery. I'm not going to say it was completely broken, mm. uh, but for perhaps just missing cues slightly. Yeah. being slightly uh, different in their view about what comms was and what they were there to do mm. as opposed to what their clients within the organisation thought they were there to do. Yes. Um, but 
Yes, you've got to get in there and you've got to understand the individuals in the team and spend quite a bit of time with each one of them and talk to them about what's going on for them and mm. what they think their job is and how they okay. think they're going in that job. So part of it is what recognising that individual difference because I understand part of what makes a great team work well is diverse perspectives, different backgrounds, yeah. different mm -hmm. personality types. Mm -hmm different ways of looking at a problem or mm. managing an opportunity. So mm. in lots of ways, you want to embrace that, those different points of view as mm. long as we have some level of engagement. Mm. Yeah. Engagement is the, is the critical word. And I think the other critical thing in that space around engagement is everybody has skills. You know, everybody and many people have been around for a while um, and people that come fresh to your team, potentially is their first job, they've, they've also got skills. But mm. often what I find is that those skills are not matched to the role that they've been asked to do. Okay. So now we have to consider, let's develop a strategy that delivers on the future state, gets this team to where they need to be within the mm. organisation, delivering on the goals of the organisation. And let's understand the structure of that team and if the current structure is actually working, not only to support that strategy, but to support that individual and that okay. individual within the team. Okay. Once you can start to get that right, you start to hum. And I have seen, talk about team transformation, I've seen individual transformation on a massive scale. From people really? that, like okay. the ones that you talked about at the beginning that are just getting in there and punching the clock and then going home, mm. and waiting out their eight hours, to people that are really actively involved and engaged. Yes. So engaged is where we want them to be. Okay. So we're talking about a, a couple of moving parts here. One is we've got our, our current state and our future state. Mm -hmm. We're getting that defined and agreed and all the key stakeholders agree that's, that's where we're going, this is where we are. And then rather than looking at the group as a team necessarily all the time, you're thinking I'm going to engage with each individual and understand uh, what's going to help them excel in this particular environment. Is that mm, what you're saying? Absolutely, because everybody has an opinion and okay. everybody knows why it's going wrong and everybody's got a view on what needs to change in order for it to be different. And sometimes they're absolutely right. Yes. Sometimes they're quite misguided and yes. sometimes they're too emotional and they're thinking about it from a perspective of personalities, which isn't necessarily helpful. But always you get really good information from really drilling down into that individual space. Yes, because I guess at some stage, no matter how much diversity you have in the team, particularly diversity of opinion or diversity of perspective, at some stage we have to agree on what we're doing and how we're doing it and what direction we're going in. We can't, I mean, it's, as much as we want to celebrate that diversity, we also need to eventually get on the same page at some stage. Yes, yeah, that's, say, that's good. Oh, good yeah. I, 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 I can see why you don't agree with this approach. I can understand that. However, uh, this is where we're going and we need to get you engaged with this or not. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess that would be diffi some difficult conversations to have. They are, those yes. People. Yes, I think so. I, um, I'm reflecting on another team that I did a bit of transformation. Well, we did a massive transformation with a team um, that was running some laboratories. And the first thing that the person who was leading that laboratory said to me when I joined to, to run that team was, um, you're the sixth director we've had in, in five months. Five you're the, months. You're the sixth <laughs> director we've had in five months. Well, what a month. Yeah, that's pretty regular, isn't it? Yes. They, they, kept, they kept firing the other... Uh, no, we were in a um, in an unnamed government department where uh, trans not transformation but change was a constant, and people were constantly being moved around. So okay. you get whole lots of, you get whole bolus restructures time and time again, and they were not open uh, to any more of this quote unquote change, Peter. So to answer your question, there is a situation that you have to overcome sometimes. When you transform, when you're looking to transform a team and to get a better outcome, not only for the individuals, for the team, but for the organisation, where you're walking into something that really is quite toxic, and you need yes. to start to learn to uh, to unpick that, and to help that team to see what the possibilities might be, but also mm. why that's going to be good for them as individuals within that team. That sounds like Simon Sinek. Start with the why. Yeah, yeah, very much <laughs> so. Start with the, the why we're doing this. So 
if you think about uh, what makes that team successful and that transformation, mm. you're you're partly saying, well, it is it is diverse perspectives and engaging diverse perspectives and engaging them in a way where they're on board with the direction we're going, mm. even though they might have uh, different different points of view. And I'm imagining too, having those different points of view can be valuable to the team in transformation too, because it's if it's not working. Doing more of the same just means you're going to be not working for longer or, mm. or, or deeper. Mm. So you mm. like the diversity idea or the diverse perspectives idea as well as they're engaged. Mm. Uh, what else is important, would you say, for a, a team in transformation? I think the number one thing is, um, if I can put it this way, the teams that I've worked with technically are excellent. They know yes. what they're meant to be doing. They yes. know the ropes. They know the job. They know technically what's going to happen. What they're often not uh, experienced at is strategic thinking. Okay. And so it's about taking the day-to-day, -day, I do this and then that happens, up a level to say why are we doing it, what are we trying to achieve, who are we achieving this for, what roles do we play to make that happen, mm. and why is there a gap between current state and future state? And if we're talking about revenue, for example, and the team that I'm talking about now um, under the transformation that I undertook with them increased their profitability by 36% within wow. the year. Wow. Uh, they increased their output by 66% with the same machineries and the same people. So what fundamentally changed was the ability to come in and say, where is your business plan? Where's mm. your capacity management plan? Within mm. that, where's your marketing plan? What is your strategy? And yes. so overlaying that into the team was what made the difference. But then okay. it's not just about having those plans, it's about revisiting those plans. So it's setting them up, but then having the consistency to consistently yeah. check back in and say, how are we moving the dial? What do we yes. need extra or different yeah. in order to keep moving that dial and keep building on our success? So it could be that you need... Um, different machinery. Maybe your mm. machinery is clapped out and that's got massive impact for your capacity planning um, mm. on your output. Or it could be that we're getting in these all of these very, very um, low-level tests to run that, you know, are getting us a dollar instead of getting us in one test that we charge $100 for. You know, so trying to reconsider how we operate and work smarter. Um, but works smarter within a, a, a set of parameters that everybody can understand. So was this a digital transformation you're talking about here? No, quite the opposite. No, this was a was... physical it was a physical review of the work that was done in a laboratory on testing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we were okay. testing for agricultural. So it was soil, plant, okay. water. Okay. So okay. it was basically get the tests in, do the tests get the results back to the clients okay. uh, and for that a charge was made um, okay. and then it was about well what is our what is our optimum how many of those could we do in a year if everything mm. was going well uh, and we had everybody on deck and we had all of our machines operating perfectly and then now mm. let's take that back by 20 percent now let's yeah. take that back by and let's work out who our ideal client should be let's go out and get okay. those ideal clients okay well, so I'm imagining it sounds like there would be a lot of what scientists or analysts yes. involved in this. Yes, that's right. And my understanding of of that perspective from a personality point of view is they like process and things being done the same way. Mm. Uh, if I'm a scientist, I'm very good at um, setting like a research outcome, for example, and then mm. following a very regimented approach, mm. scientific approach to arrive at an outcome. Mm. So if you're talking about change, that automatically, if I'm a scientist, I may not like that a lot. I may not embrace it as much as yes. other folks. Is, yes. So that's the case? Yes. I do think that there is a certain bent of scientists to show me the empirical data, show me yes. the reasons why. Uh, yeah. And certainly that was, there was an element of that. But yes. I have to say I do thoroughly respect those scientists and the work that they do and the absolute intellectual intellectual rigour that they bring to the work on a day-to-day -day basis. But it, I would, I, it would be wrong of me not to say that, that scientists aren't a fabulous bunch of quirky people 
And yes. so dealing with this fabulous bunch of quirky people, we get back to that, who is the individual that I'm dealing with? What yes. does this individual need from me in order to feel safe and secure to yeah. make a change? Or even safe and secure to come to me and say, what you're suggesting won't work. And here are the yeah. reasons why I think that won't work. But here are some ways that we could talk about what might work if we did something slightly different. Um, but yes, but I don't, I, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, just the purview of the scientists, Peter. I think that you can go into any team and you will find that wall of people that say, we've tried this before. This won't yes. work. This is yes. going to be too difficult. I'm very yeah. happy just sitting here, you know, plugging this into that and, and seeing what happens and knowing that we're not going to get the outcomes we need. Not my problem. Not bothered yes. anymore. Yeah. And there's likely to be, if you think of, you think of scientists or think of engineers or think of uh, like IT, technical skill professionals, systems engineers, you think uh, they, they are very good at that, at that process thinking, if you like. Mm. And you think, well, and, and that's key to, as you're suggesting, that's what you're selling, if you like. You're selling that. Mm. The process and the reliability of the result. Mm. You're saying, yep, let's, okay, let's keep that piece and keep you psychologically safe. Yes. If I can use that phrase. Yes, please use in, that phrase. I think that's an in, important phrase. Yeah. Yeah. I'm psychologically, I'm feeling psychologically safe. I'm feeling validated in, in my role. And while I'm doing this, I'm also uh, engaging with this other way of thinking from different parts of the business because that's, that's key to what we're delivering to our ultimate client. Is that it? And that's part of what's making that team successful. Yes. In that environment. Yes. And it's, get... it's not going to happen overnight. This is something that you have to gently lead the team through. You talked about engagement at the beginning. Um, and I think that's, that's the critical thing is you have to operate, uh, on an individual by individual basis, determine what the future state would be working with the executives. Yeah. Come back to that team and say, here is what I have found. Here is what I think will work. You help me pull this apart and show me where it won't work. Mm. There is a point where you come to or you say, thank you so much for your input. As a result of your input, I have come to the conclusion that we will be doing X and Y and Z, and I'm looking for your support to make that happen. Mm. And, and there will still be the naysayers, but the hardest part is the hardest person. So we keep going back to those people that had some pretty strong views and saying, mm -hmm. I just want to share with you where I've got to with this. Here's what I'm seeing in terms of change. Here's what I'm seeing in terms of, um, let's talk about output, improvement in output. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm seeing also in terms of people's happiness and engagement with coming to the workplace. What are you seeing? What, what can you tell me now, sort of three months on, so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. continuous checking back in with those, with those hardest people is a way, I think, to start to break down some of those barriers that people might have to change. Yeah. You mentioned, or we talked about that phrase a little while ago, with psychological safety, and, it, and some of the research I've seen with teams is that team members that feel psychologically safe mm. are more likely to perform at a higher level, both mm -hmm. individually and as a group. Mm. What's been your perspective or your experience with psychological safety in working with high-performing teams? Mm. Gee, that's the million-dollar question. I think the critical success factor in getting psychological safety in any team is leadership vulnerability. I think it's wow, about okay. saying, I need your help in order for us all to be successful. Yeah. I will support you. I will understand you as an individual and I will work with you as an individual to get help you get the most out of this experience. At the end of the day, I will lead and I will tell you how it's going to be, but I won't do that um, in a dictatorial fashion. We will have meaningful ongoing okay. conversations. Uh, so then that only goes so far because some organisations have a lack of psychological safety starting from the very top. Yes. So you can create in your own bubble, if you like, your psychological safety for your team and you can operate as the buffer for the next layer up. And that is the way I think that you need to operate if you're genuinely in 
a uh, toxic environment where you don't necessarily have control over what that CEO will do next or how yes. they will treat their own team yeah. members yeah. and their executives yeah. sitting around the board table. That all has a, has a triple down impact, but you can be a buffer and you can create psychological safety within your own team. It's proven. Yeah. It's proven because when you see in organisations that run their engagement stress surveys on an annualised basis, you will see pockets even within an organisation that comes down with a very poor engagement score, pockets of excellence. So it is possible to create that. Yes. Yes, it is possible. And uh, when I think of psychological safety, I also think of vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a, if I'm a senior leader, I may be thinking I can't be vulnerable in any way. I need to be bulletproof. I need to be smart, have all the answers, mm. uh, never be confused, never be mm. asking for advice, which if, if I take that perspective and I'm not vulnerable at all, mm. uh, I'm likely to create a less psychologically safe environment. And particularly, uh, I find, I, I can't speak obviously as a, as a female leader. I know as a, a male leader and having worked with senior males, often vulnerability is one of the hardest things for them to get their head around because mm. it, it, it goes to, it doesn't just go to the leadership part, it goes to the gender part as well. Mm. You think I can't be vulnerable, I, I need to be this, particularly in, in the more engineering uh, technical environments, uh, the, these so-called STEM environments where they're, they're, they're likely to be a lot more males than females. Yep. Mm -hmm. This this invulnerability mm. in the senior leadership group, uh, I guess what you're suggesting is that wouldn't create psychological safety for the teams below them. It's a really good question whether vulnerability and psychological safety um, are mutually exclusive. I would say, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said at the beginning, the executive who's trying to effect transformational change within a team and comes in and says, I have got a way, I can see a yeah. way clearly forward, yeah. must be excellent in what they do. They must yes. be the one that says, I have, I have transformed teams before. I am excellent at strategic thinking. I'm excellent at this. I'm excellent at that. I do need you to come along with me. You can't, you can't falter and say, I don't really know what I'm doing in that environment. <laughs> but what you can say is here is who I am as a human being. And I yes. think that the more that you expose who you are truly as a human being, um, the more you are appealing to them as, 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 as a person rather than yeah. just a teammate. I'm, I'm thinking about an example of a fabulous CEO that I had when I was in financial services, and he, mm. run, he ran a part of an organisation which was a much larger organisation. Um, and he was technically excellent and, and was really a terrific strategist and a tough taskmaster, mm. but was very open about here is who I am as a person. Here's what I do in my spare time. Here's what my family looks like, does, is. Here's yeah. what my values are, you know. So, yeah. so now we're learning about you as a, as a human being, mm. but we're also quarantining your right and the role that you play in driving strategy and driving yes. outcome. So mm. I, 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 does that make sense, Peter? Am I, am I explaining that to you in a way that resonates it, it, it with makes, what you're saying? It, 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 makes, it makes a lot of sense. It's being, it's being real and it's being human. And it, it, also, it also leaves people something to do. I remember six years ago uh, I was working with a, a CEO and uh, I, was, I was asked to, to coach her because she, she wasn't getting engagement from her her business basically and I was invited the way I met her was I, I saw her sp uh, speaking at a conference like a, a major conference of all the employees and she was talking about strategy and vision and where the company was going to go forward and it was brilliant she looked looked great up there she spoke brilliantly she outlaid this this end-to-end -end plan that was beautifully thought through and uh, and when she sat down I, when I first met her uh, in the coaching conversation she said, so what did you think? And I said, that was, that was an outstanding performance, but you've left, you, number one, you're bulletproof, you're perfect. And number two, you've left them nothing to do. It, it, you've left them nothing to do because you've, you've laid it all out. So if I'm sitting in that audience, and I was watching, I was in the audience watching these, these people, 
and I could see their reaction. The reaction was, well, I don't, I don't need to do anything. There's such a big, she knows it all. She's got the, and she did. She had it all laid out brilliantly. She's very, very smart person. But you think, well, I've got nothing to do. I'm, I'm just going to be following this, all these steps indefinitely. Yes. And, she, and she's going to take all the glory. Yes, yes. So we thought, well, uh, exactly to your point, uh, show some humanity, show some, if I can use that Brene Brown word, vulnerability, mm. show, show, show some spaces for other people to fill. I think that, that only they can uniquely fill because you can't you can't fill every space of a thousand people in a room. Yeah, and I think what you're also talking about is humility. Yes. So uh, you know you've risen to a certain level in an organisation. You're a trusted yeah. executive. You're being compensated well for that yes. role. You don't need to be the one that constantly gets up there um, and, and, and shouts from the rooftop about what the success and the achievement has been. So yes. one of the things that I always introduce when I go to an organisation, we've set the strategy, is then the platform by which the team tells the transformation story. And okay. they're not saying, I'm telling you a story about transformation. They're saying, here is the strategy and let me tell you about what we have done to move towards our future state in the last month, in the last three months. And let us talk about what we're going to do in the next three months that will further take us down this pathway of achieving these, you know, elements and goals and objectives that you've asked us to achieve. And so by giving them the platform, they themselves are telling the story about how things are changing. They've got the pride in telling that story and they get mm. the kudos and they want to do it again. And they don't want yes. to get up in three months' time at the next 90-day check-in in front of 200 of their colleagues and say, we didn't move the dial. They yes. want to say, last month we had a 200% increase in social media uh, click-throughs. This month we improved that by 100%. This month we're going to go this further and this is yeah. how we're going to go about it. So I think uh, in giving them something to do, their job is what they need to do, but you've got to provide that clarity around what is it that I'm asking you to do and how am I supporting you? What's the framework that I'm giving you to be successful? Yes, okay. So we talk, we've talked about diversity, engaging diverse team members. We've talked about psychological safety. It, it sounds like what we're talking about now is, is having some sort of shared vision or purpose. Yeah. what's taking place. Yes, that's where the team yes. comes in. And that's where you yes. can have a disparate bunch of people that's called a team on the org chart that isn't a team. But yeah. once you get people all pulling in the same direction, knowing what their role is in driving the needle yeah. forward, then then you start to get a sense of team. And yes. that is that is a really exciting place to be because the yeah. momentum that you've built and the motivation that that drives is just a thing of beauty. And it's, you know yourself, working in high-performing teams. That's, that's where the dream is, isn't it? And that's where yeah, coming yeah. to work is, is not, you know, because work's got its ups and downs and it's not always smooth sailing. But it is enjoyable because you know yeah. that you've got purposeful work to do and you know you're moving towards something better. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I've seen that experience exactly, Amanda. I recall a transformation project I was working on several years ago, and the most intransigent member uh, was a, uh, a, a younger, a younger uh, female in the team who was very resistant. And her biggest resistance was about uh, what buses she was catching home. Hmm. There was a particular bus she wanted to get to work and a particular bus, which was relatively early in, in my view mm, of the day, mm. that she wanted to get home. Mm. And this, this bus thing was like really, really key to her. I've got to be I catch this bus in the morning and this bus in the evening. And her whole day was about getting off the bus and getting on the bus run. Mm. And uh, we thought we'd lost her at one stage because it, it was requiring uh, an investment of time, which sometimes meant that that bus schedule wasn't going to be met. Uh, until she came in one, uh, we were having at one of our early um, stand-up meetings and she was there. Uh, she was there early and she started catching early, wanting to get up and catch earlier buses. Because she didn't want to miss your stand-up. 
Yeah. yeah. She wanted to, she wanted to be there. Yeah. Not, not 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 because of fear of missing out, but she was getting very engaged. We thought, wow, we finally cracked it. She's catching an earlier bus. Yes. It was something as simple as that. Yes. And what was it we were forcing her to catch a bus? Was like, no, she wanted to get up earlier and she wanted to and part of it was she had a young family and she wanted to get exercise and I could understand completely her schedule. It wasn't as if I was she was being disingenuous. Yes. I, I could see completely, but she reconfigured her morning sure so she could get in earlier for these stand-ups and i thought wow yeah we got her you did 100 <laughs> percent. she was she was engaged mm. so so it, it is about sharing vision and purpose and i guess um, having the team's fingerprints on that too like having them not just have someone tell them what it is but uh, leave some leave some margins for them to put fingerprints on it yeah well like i said to you um earlier on this conversation most teams aren't completely broken, right? Yes, okay. M many, many people, we, we might disagree with everybody, but many people want to come to work to do a good job. So yeah. now it's about how do we take the current state and corral it in a way that's got this shared vision, this strategic purpose, this clarity of yeah. goals, and allow you to do the great work that you do within an environment where you can then tell that story about the great work that you're doing and how yes. that plugs into this part and that plugs into that part and that is absolutely making a difference for the organisation. So, yes, their fingerprints um, are all over it. Yes, they're driving it. Yes, it's them. It's they're the ones. And that's what I mean about giving people a platform to tell their story about how they're moving forward. Yeah. Yes. And I'm curious too for your thoughts on this, Amanda. Uh, clearly, over the past four or five years, we've worked uh, to a more virtual environment. I mean, some of the clients I'm working with now, they're completely virtual. No one goes to work anymore. Like, no one's in the same building anymore. Uh, and one of the clients is actually selling buildings because they don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, there's, there's no requirement at all to be at work, like be in an office together. And the way uh, most of my experience has been uh, with teams that are geographically close or in the same office and that can often help teamwork because you see each other catch up for a coffee you might mention something to somebody or notice something going on and it, you can have, you can eat meals together there's a whole lot of things that helps foster that environment i'm wondering whether you've noticed uh, a change over the, over the past few years on on uh, team performance in a more virtual environment where we're we're, we're more virtual rather than together. Do you think that's got an impact too? On productivity? On productivity, yeah. That? I'm thinking of cohesiveness and I'm thinking all the, all, yes. all, yeah, all, all the great ideas you're think, we're talking yes. about, like like sharing vision, diversity, feeling mm. psychologically mm. safe, a lot of these really important things we're talking about with teams. Mm. Uh, they, I'm thinking they would be more challenging, mm. not less important, still still as important but more challenging yeah. if we're all in separate places. I mean, this client I'm thinking of, people are actually, uh, this is a, a client in Sydney, and people, the employees are moving out of Sydney to more remote areas, which is great for their work-life balance. They're, they've got less mortgage stress. Mm -hmm. They're living in environments for their families which are, which are more enjoyable, uh, which is fantastic. But when you think about the team, if, if we're all over the geography, wherever we are in the world, mm -hmm. and we, we're not coming together, that must make this more challenging, don't you think? Yes, it's, a, it's definitely more challenging. And the thing that when we were in deep lockdown that I found worked the best with team cohesiveness was it's not all about the work. So okay. starting every team meeting with a check-in, which um, yep. is an idea that I'm, I learned from a CEO in another life where it's about, so Peter, tell us in, you know, swift you know, we don't want 15 minutes, but give us quickly <laughs> what's happening with your son's 21st. What's the plan? Okay. What are you going to be doing? Okay. Mary Kate, tell us about the, you know, the trip that you've got planned. Let's understand a bit more about you as, as humans and individuals. Um, yeah. There's that. I think that is really critical. So make time for that sort of conversation on the team basis on the, and let everybody yes. hear it. Because then when Mary Kate might be calling Peter later on in the week, She's got an intro to you and she's yeah, able yeah. to ask you more about you. So now we're forming deeper connections that way. The other thing mm. that we did um, was we instituted an award 
And uh, okay. it was just pretty, you know, uh, it was a bit of a harebrained, called a bit of a harebrained thing, but it was very meaningful because we identified what our values were in that team. And let's let's say it was um, cooperation, you know, uh, supporting your teammates, so on and so forth, all the usual suspects, uh, you know, being optimistic, being creative. At the yeah. at the monthly team meeting, we would say, mm. has anybody got an award that they want to give out? And I just went okay. on to Canva and I, I did up this little award with this, you know, 1950s bowling person, bowling a strike. And then they would stop and they would say, yes, I want to give award, an award to Cassandra about, you know, okay. being collegiate. And she did X, Y, and Z for me this week. She didn't have to do it. She dropped everything and that made blah, 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 made this easier. And then at the end of a quarter, we would give out the award like a, a virtual trophy. And okay. people loved it more than you would imagine. It was a wow. simple exercise that we went through but in doing that we were also reinforcing the values that we had as a team okay. calling out the good behaviors but also understanding what's what's cassandra working on now on a deeper level that we, we might not have understood before because we're going through okay. the stats and we're understanding that but what is the human element that drives that success at another level okay. that we're not measuring so these were this was an award based on like a team characteristic or a team value, like cooperation, like yeah, collaboration, well, yes. something there like that. There were four or five different values within our team okay. that we had all agreed on. Okay. And then you would be you would be given an award based on one of those values. And then the person that got the most was most awarded at the end of a period of time was given um, a trophy. Wow. Yeah. And a virtual, a virtual trophy. You were able to take these <laughs> and we would e we would put them in the chat and so people would fill them out. And they'd be in the chat, and you could download it. And one of the women, one of the women on the one call said, "I tell you, I haven't received an award since I was in the seventh grade. I am printing well. that out, and that is going on the fridge." You know, and it's <laughs> like, but you, you can't underestimate the value of being appreciated and being appreciated yeah. by your peers. So, mm. to come back around to your question, I think that the virtual world is here to stay. Uh, the best yes. we can hope for is hybrid. I think there are lots, lots to be gained from having a virtual world. I believe productivity does not necessarily suffer, but I think the human element suffers. And so yes. what we need to do is to devise different ways for us to be human in a virtual way mm. with each other. Yes, And there's just That's, a couple of examples of, of how I would try yeah. to do that. Yeah, because it's, it's harder to be human virtually. It is. It's not impossible because I feel, it's I feel impossible. we're it's having just, a human moment right now, you know, so it's not impossible, yeah. but you have it's, to make it part it's, of the plan. It's, it's an extra. It, it requires an extra effort. If you're mm. leading a team mm. in change, in transformation, or you're participating in one, and all of us would be in one, one or both of, of those two categories, mm. and I'm operating virtually, which is also very likely, a lot of the time, if not all the time, I need to make an extra effort for, yeah. around this, the team values, having them in action, recognising them, calling them out and rewarding them. And you need to make time for it. And I think um, in today's world, it's often the first thing that goes, if it's quick, 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 we've got to deliver on this thing yeah. and we've got yeah. limited time to do so. And that, that sort of thing is the, the quickest and the easiest thing to dispense with. But I, I would argue it's the thing you should least dispense with because if you want to get motivation and you want to get momentum yeah. and keep it up, people have to feel that they're more than a cog in a wheel. Yes, yes. And that would be like most teams in transformation have got a very large goal and not quite enough time to achieve it. So it's, it's, it's those two things are usually consistent, aren't they? Yeah. If there's plenty of time and the goal's really small, yeah. well, it doesn't really need a special effort, does it? It's just... At BAU, business as usual. Well, this is an interesting question. Does the team in transformation know it's in transformation? I know I've come to transform that team and I know the steps mm. I need to take to make that happen. And I know yes. I'm reporting back and having regular conversations with the senior executive who's engaged me to do that. But I don't go to the team and say, we're transforming. <laughs> I don't do that. I wouldn't use okay. the word transformation with the team at all. At the okay. end... When I'm waving, you keep it secret, would you, Amanda? When I'm keep waving it secret. goodbye, <laughs> I say, "Look how we've transformed," but yeah, okay. um, it's not part of the ongoing conversation. We are in transformation. 
what's part of the ongoing conversation is we are aligning around a strategy and here's what okay. that strategy looks like and here's what we're trying to achieve and here's what I need you to do as part of that. Is what I need okay. every other member of the team to do as part of that. We will regularly have conversations. You talked about a Monday morning stand-up at this uh, educational institution uh, that I mentioned before. That was my favourite meeting of the whole week where we would literally yeah. stand up, go to a board. This was before virtual. You could do it easier in yeah. a virtual situation. Stand in front of a board and talk about what the plan was and each person talk yeah. to how they're moving towards the goals. So, yes. um, so yeah, uh, team transformation is, a, is, is something that's the out, outcome at the end of a process where you know you want more and you know you want different from a team. Yes. And they're capable of And you know why. And you know, and you know why. <laughs> yeah, and in, in both examples, let me say that we've achieved that with exactly the same people, right? So when somebody, the senior executive says, this team is a basket case, if those people at anywhere have heard that, that's come through, you know, their grapevine, imagine what that makes you feel like. I'm in a team that's a basket case, right? But that means I'm a basket case, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> but each of these people as individuals, when you sit down with them, everyone's got a story. Everyone's got yeah. skills. Everyone's got experience. So now it's my job to say, how can we make that all work together in order to get here? And they all care. They all want to do a great job. Yeah, they do. They care. They care. They care. I want to be. I, I care about doing a great job yeah. for me and for my colleagues. Yes. And I want to feel good about what I do. Yes. Yes. No matter what bus I catch, I want to be. When I get there, I want to be doing a. I want to be doing a great job. It reminds me. I mean, it, it reminds me of like sporting analogies. And you think about uh, teams, and I'm sure we've all watched team sports. And a very engaged or less engaged. You've seen teams play, and it can be the same people on the team. And one week they can perform brilliantly and win well, and other weeks they don't perform that well. And you think, well, it's the same people with the same goal, if you like, to win the game. Yeah. Uh, but there's something different about how they're operating or how they're playing yeah. together mm -hmm. that means they're more likely to win. And what you're talking about there is, hey, take the same people yeah. and fire them all, and get a yeah. that creates a whole lot of other issues if you start firing and hiring to because they're all basket cases. Hey, no, they're great people; they don't really care. Yes, and they've got they've got awesome skills. Let's work out a way of yeah. making them hum. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And there's there's something in there about praise, and um, and it doesn't have to be you know laid on thick with a trowel, but even as I described, giving them a platform to tell their story has elements of praise. So yeah. it's um it's it's sort of a passive praise, as as opposed to an overt praise, but it allows them to access that part of themselves that wants to do better, wants to do more. Yes, yeah. Um, I remember an early leader I had. She had a great phrase, and she was teaching me how to lead. I was like in my mid to late twenties, and she was she was teaching me um, to lead. And she taught me she taught me two great things. One of them was. Um, Talk to people uh, uh, at their best, like talk to the best version of them. Yeah. Like, like ex don't expect extraordinary things, although they're capable of extraordinary things, but speak to the best. And the second thing she taught me, which is what you've echoed today, uh, because I, when I took over this team, it was a team of like 50 or 60 people or running a very big client. Through a bunch of circumstances, I was the, I was the leader of this group. And and Trish, my boss, said, "So Peter, what are you going to do?" And I said, "I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to pick from the. It was a big ad, ad agency. I'm going to pick from the agency the people that I like that are on board with how I'm thinking, and em employ more that uh, like what I'm doing and, and I like." And she said, "That's the worst strategy. You've got to find some people you don't like, <laughs> right? <laughs> some diverse thinking. I was thinking I'll get a whole bunch of people together that all think the same way as me, and I'll lead them in this direction, mm -hmm. and I'll and I'll I'll just berate them." I said, "No, the opposite." And it was. They are really good lessons, which is the same thing that you're saying here. Yes. Uh, she drilled that into me, and I thought, "Wow, thank you, Trish. That's yes. that was great. It was the opposite of what I was thinking of doing yes. on both counts." And and I think to add to what Trish was saying, start by imagining or thinking that every single person in that team is excellent. It's yes. just that and you, talk to them that way. You haven't talk unpacked them that, that yet. You yeah. haven't found sometimes what they're excellent at. Or, and, and maybe they, maybe, or maybe they haven't either. I mean, yeah. uh, maybe because we're all we're all combinations of of different, like of excellent thoughts and, and and average thoughts. So her idea was talk to them and treat them as if they're excellent, 
set them challenges as if they're excellent. Talk to them that way. Talk to that part of them, mm. and you'll get the best out of mm. them. I thought, yeah, wow, that's that's a really cool perspective because I, I was more I was more stick than carrot then. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes, well, I think I was more... <laughs> we've all learned a lot in our long, long <laughs> careers. That's for sure. There's certainly things we'd go back and do differently now. Um, but it, talking about excellence, that team that was described by the senior executive as a basket case, within two years of putting in place this transformation, um, they actually won that senior executive's award for team excellence. Wow. Wow. So it was a. So it worked. It worked. Yeah. And that's it's nice excellent. when it's externally validated, isn't yeah. it? It's nice when you get those pointy things to put on the mantelpiece. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking from from two perspectives, Amanda. I'm thinking if I'm a if I'm a leader listening to this, I'm leading a team or I'm leading an organisation. What would be the the one tip or the one idea or one thought you'd say if you're leading a team in transformation? Mm. Here's the one main thing to be thinking about. Individuals. What would that one thing be? The individuals, individuals make up the team. Sit down with them okay. as individuals, even if you've been leading them, quote unquote, for years. Stop. Yeah. Take stock. Hear what they have to say. Everybody will tell you why precisely they think it's not working. Okay. Much of that will be valuable. And yeah. so if you are genuinely open and vulnerable as a leader and yeah. able to yeah. say, yes, I'm ready for us to change and to do things differently. You don't need to go very far to find out what the answers are, which is why I'm lucky as a consultant being able to go into organisations because the people have the answers. All you've got to do is find a way to tap into that and to understand, okay, so that's why there's a gap between current state and future state. That's why. And here are the things that we need to fix. So, Yeah. uh, Yeah. yeah, that would be my advice. And what about what about if I'm... A member, which this could be the same person. I'm a member, I'm a member of a team, uh, and I'm really keen to to engage in transformation and be a, a really uh, useful and productive team member mm. in transformation. Mm. What would your advice be to me or for me? So, if you're ready to be a really good member of that team, then I think you're more than halfway there. What you need okay. to understand, possibly is what your nearest teammate needs and what the other okay. teammate needs and how then you can okay. be genuinely part of a team and not just okay. about the, as they say, there's no I in team, Peter. So, uh, <laughs> so a good teammate is looking around them at the same time as they're looking at their own okay. work. Okay. I'm looking around me and thinking, okay, what does Amanda need or what does Jack need? Mm. How can I be a better teammate to Amanda or how can I be a better teammate yeah. to Jack? Especially if you've got a bit of, um, you know, mileage, you've been around for a while. Yeah. Especially if you are that um, disenfranchised person that we talked about at the top of, of this conversation and thinking, yeah. I'm just going to punch the clock. You know? You're the yeah. one that can see. You're looking across and you're seeing all the reasons why those other teammates are not motivated and what's going yes. wrong for them. So maybe it's about yeah. being brave. Maybe it's about going once more to someone who yeah. can make a difference and saying, we're demotivated and here are the reasons why. Yeah, catch that earlier bus. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just catch an earlier bus <laughs> and just show that you're keen, you're interested, you're engaged and doing something demonstrable, not for yourself but for the, your colleagues around you. I, well, I actually think she was doing it for herself. I think that's, but that's the beauty of what you were able to generate for her was an environment where she felt like, as you said, if I don't get there, I'm going to be missing out. I've got to be there. This is actually yeah. an important meeting. And how yeah. many people these days say they go to important meetings? Not very many. How many people blow yeah. off meetings because they think, you know, this is not going to move the dial at all? So yeah. kudos to you for creating that, uh, that mythical beast, the important meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the mythical beast. I, I got her. I still think about her catching that bus and what a, what a big deal it was. Wow, that's that's re- that's really really cool. Yeah. Really really cool. Amanda, this has been an absolute delight. Uh, getting your your wisdom on on teams in transformation, uh, and I thank you hugely for being a guest on Growth Tales today. Thank you, Peter. It's been an absolute pleasure.